Hi, I'm Meva Spencer. Today we're going to outer space. We've been traveling a little bit this week, but I bet you have never been to outer space before. And uh, we have a lady who's going to take us. She's a regular space journeyer, and uh, she's a combatant against space wars. So if you ever, I have never seen the film Star Wars, so I'm culturally deprived. But uh, I believe it's about some of the terrible things that might happen if the worlds get into collision. And uh, so we've got to worry about not only how to cre create peace on earth, but how to keep wars out of the heavens. This is Jessica West. Hello, Jessica. Hi, Meta. Jessica is a, a research scholar at the at Project Plowshares, which is in Waterloo, Ontario. And uh, it's kind of a progressive think tank funded by churches, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, largely. Uh, at least it was originally. And we, uh, um, there are a lot of people there looking into various aspects of militarization and uh, weaponry and things of that kind. So Jessica's specialty these days is outer space. And we're going to have a good conversation about that because I had to confess to her that this is not an area that I know a thing about. And I'm woefully ignorant, but um, we, she's going to enlighten me. And the first thing I've got to get straightened out is what is this rope ladder in the background? And she's got a wonderful um, uh, green screen or something that is a visual of, looks like a rope ladder. Where's this? Honestly, I'm not sure. I'm lucky enough to be able to squat in my husband's office today. Uh, it's a painting, so it's not a, a green screen. Oh, and okay. Uh -huh. And it's hanging on the wall, and it's it's pre-COVID, so it's just by a stroke of luck that this piece of art is so artfully positioned <laughs> um, exactly where I set up my computer. So usually, uh, usually we're at home working, the two of us. And um, today we had a chance to sign up and use the office space and give our give our minds a bit of a break and mm -hmm. our spirits a bit of a break from those same four walls that we've been staring at for the last year. It's great to meet you, Jessica. We, we have not become friends until now. So now you're officially my friend. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Let's start off by considering what I thought was a pretty good thing. We had a treaty banning what I thought was the weaponization of space. But you set me right. Well, we do have a very good treaty in place. And uh, I, I think that should be made clear. The Outer Space Treaty is um, the pillar of governance in space. It sets the broad principles by which states have agreed to access and use outer space. And that includes concepts like peaceful purposes, cooperation, equity, um, uh, not contaminating the environment. So it's it, it's an excellent treaty, and I think it has stood the test of time. But when it comes to weapons, it's also a product of, of its era, which is the 1960s. And um, it does ban the use or the orbiting or placement of weapons of mass destruction in outer space, notably nuclear weapons, which was a, a big concern at that time. Um, but it's otherwise silent on conventional weapons or the use of conventional force in outer space. And that hole has been there from the beginning. Um, there have been efforts to plug that hole through the Conference on Disarmament for about 40 years now. And uh, instead of plugging it, it's sort of gotten bigger over time as technology has accelerated. Uh, more states can access space and the capabilities to harm objects in space um, spread and become more accessible. So about two or three sentences ago, when I began thinking, as you mentioned, conventional weapons in space, and I was wondering, well, what conventional weapons could anybody use in space? Bows and arrows? I mean, um, landmines? I mean, what? <laughs> there's not much you can do except with high-tech uh, weapons, like, you know, nuclear weapons or lasers. Do, are lasers and uh, beams and things like that, are they forbidden? 
No. Um, so all that is forbidden is the use of weapons of mass destruction. So that would include biological, which probably doesn't have a role to play in outer space, given the fact that we're dealing with technology systems and hardware. Um, but what conventional force refers to is non-nuclear, um, non-biological, non-chemical. So really the kinetic use of force. And um, you can think of any number of ways in which that could be put to use to destroy an object in orbit. Um, Bombs. So just bombs or well we've gone beyond bombs um i think i think dirty bombs were sort of a, a an early experiment that took place but what what we have now is uh, a number of states have the capability to use a modified uh, anti-ballistic missile system and and target a satellite instead of targeting a ballistic missile and so we have seen demonstrations against not against foreign objects but against their own objects of states, um, you know, intercepting a satellite using a missile system. Um, China in recent years was the first to sort of kick off what I consider a new era of, um, uh, you know, of a submarine arms race in outer space in 2008. Uh, they, China, they, they started uh, trying to... Well, they didn't start anything, but in 2008, <laughs> China demonstrated that it had the capability to modify its um, ballistic missile defense systems and use it to target a satellite. And so they okay, destroyed so one I of their own satellites on orbit. The United States followed suit, although in, in a less destructive demonstration in 2000, um, in 2008. And, and India is the latest to demonstrate this capability in 2019. And so that's the kinetic use of force. That's conventional use of force. Um, you're not exploding a nuclear weapon, but you're using a weapon system to destroy an object in space, a satellite. And that's legal. That um, is legal. Yeah. And, and you said lasers are legal. And uh, I'm still back three sentences when I'm thinking about you say lasers are not considered weapons of mass destruction. But, you know, 20 years ago, I was saying, I don't think it even makes sense for them to be working on developing ballistic missiles because they're getting to the point where they can just shoot each other with lasers and, and destroy a city or take out, uh, you know, somebody's backyard that, you know, we could have a war with just beams and not uh, ballistic missiles. And people laughed at me. I, I remember they did not take me seriously, but I think a, a laser could be a weapon of mass destruction, that kind of beams. Well, weapon of mass destruction is a very technical concept, and so that's why a laser doesn't fit in. Is it a weapon? Yes, a laser can be used as a weapon, and it can be used to cause harm. And, and maybe you are just ahead of your time. There's certainly been an acceleration in um, exploring capabilities for laser systems, including for um, ballistic defense or defense against drones and that kind of activity. Um, in space, we've seen lasers tested, not necessarily to you know, explode objects on orbit, um, but lower, lower power lasers can be used to interfere with the, the functioning of a satellite. So you can use it to dazzle or blind sensors on a satellite that might be taking images or to otherwise hinder its ability to function. And that is a less, uh, I guess, disastrous use of force in outer space. That would be something that might be temporary and reversible, um, but really, your point, which I think is well taken, is that no, there are no rules or laws against this kind of activity. Um, and so that's concerning because it's easy to escalate, um, to escalate tensions in space and to escalate the use of force from minor interference to more significant interference and, and destruction, destruction of objects. And so filling this hole has really been a focus of the international uh, diplomatic and space community for quite a long time now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, at a, one of the Pugwash meetings uh, two or three years ago in Nova Scotia, there was a woman, Laura Greco, I think, from the Union of Concerned Scientists. And, and she was, uh, she had a, sort of a, I don't know, graphic that showed the, the ways satellites travel and, and so on. And her, her point was, her argument was anyway, that although 
ballistic missiles are never good enough to really fight a war because you or this whole thing of ABMs shooting down missiles with other other missiles, you know, they're 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 not close to ever making that work. The whole the whole thing that Reagan was trying to do. But she said they're they're very good for taking out satellites. So if you want to have a satellite war, uh, I mean, a war with somebody and and that outfit has that country has satellites that they depend on and god knows we all do now i mean everything we do depends on satellites gps and and everything uh then you could you could use your you know those missiles abm type weapons against the satellites. Now you make it sound like, well, that wouldn't be too bad because you could, they're reversible. But if you really want to have a war and take out everybody's satellites, whoa, we'd be in big trouble. No, we? I, we were talking about lasers when I said low, oh, okay. low lasers that dazzle a sensor. It's uh, different than, so what you're talking about is what I was just talking about in terms of those demonstrations that took place in 2007, 2008, and 2019. Oh, what that, was that? This that, is- that's exactly what you described, uh, Laura Grego, she's excellent at Union of Concerned Scientists. That's exactly what she was speaking to, was these demonstrations, the ability to use um, an anti-ballistic missile system. Instead of having it target and hone in on a ballistic missile, which travels very quickly and can, in some cases, maneuver and be unpredictable, mm-hmm. targeting a satellite, which rotates around the Earth and a stable and predictable orbit is much easier to do. Um, Except, of course, there's limitations on ha- on height. And so, mm-hmm. you know, satellites, are some of them are very, very far away from Earth and some of them are much closer to Earth. Um, so they're not all necessarily in reach, but certainly that technology, what you described, that, that use of that s- ballistic missile defense system against a space object instead of against a missile is, is a concern and it's been demonstrated to work. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we've got to do something to beef up the the uh, space treaty, I guess, to make it cover the real risks that we threat we are threatened with today, right? And what are they? What are your concerns about things that are worrisome as far as space wars of the future go? Well, I think what's worrisome is that space war in space used to be taboo in a way. Um, Space was seen as a peaceful domain. Uh, Certainly there were lots of military satellites in orbit that were used for war fighting functions on Earth, but space itself was relatively free of threats. Um, And what we've seen in the last few years is a shift towards considering and conceptualizing outer space itself as a domain of warfare, the same as air and, and Earth and the seas. And that is worrying because if we, as we've been talking about, there are really very few restrictions on what that might look like in terms of the activities that are permissible or where the limits of such war fighting might be. And um, there's not a lot of understanding about what the repercussions of some activities in space could be. So there, there's not a history there that can be built upon. Um, if I dazzle a satellite with a laser, how is that interpreted by another state? Is that seen as not very bad and we're going to do tit for tat? Or is that seen as something atrocious and the response is much greater than I think? So the, the patterns of escalation are very um, unknown. Mm-hmm. And, and you might have completely different perceptions of risk uh, by different actors as well. Um, And so I I think overall that policy shift is worrying and uh, we see it with the creation of um, the U.S. Space Force as sort of um, not a cause of this, but a a symptom. And I think we see it with, with China and Russia and India and the United Kingdom and France and a lot of countries right now are trying to think about how do we defend ourselves in outer space? How do we make sure these essential systems um, can be protected? Um, and to do so, they're moving towards more of a military footing in outer space. Um, and so what are the risks? I think there's a lot. We've talked about the use of conventional force, so the use of a, of a missile system to intercept a satellite. Um, there is certainly progression evident 
So now you said something the other day when we were first talking about doing this show that surprised me because I, I said um, something about how uh, in a war countries might try to interrupt each other's uh, satellite transmissions. And you said they do that all the time. And I thought, oh, my God, I didn't know that. Uh, are people t- tell me what's going on? Uh, did you say what I thought you said? <laughs> Yeah, so satellites are essentially data collection and dissemination systems, and their value lies in the data and the information that they send back to Earth, and that is usually sent through uh, use of the radio frequency spectrum. And so um, that is something that's not protected or hardened. It's, it's, It's relatively easy to disrupt the radio frequency spectrum, and so electronic warfare Um, as you say, the jamming of satellite signals so that they're temporarily unavailable or the spoofing of satellite signals. I think we've seen that with GPS a few times. There have been news reports over the years of, you know, ships that were going the wrong way or um, GPS being jammed. That that happens, uh, certainly. And Oh, no, you make that sound normal. Uh, It is normal. It is normal. And so the question is, you know, again, how do you stop that from escalating further? Uh, Are there certain systems that should be protected? Um, It's normal because it's it's not unique to space. Uh, You know, uh, electronic warfare is also something that takes place against uh, against aircraft and pretty much any kind of weapon system that uses the radio frequency spectrum. Nowadays, we're we're doing things to tamper with other people's aircraft or interrupting their their radio transmission or something? I, uh, I, in a war, I, yes. <laughs> you say they're doing it now. Something like that. I thought you said that. Yeah, so the ability to jam satellite signals is fairly widespread. Some are harder to jam and more protected, like, like uh, very secure um, military communication satellites, but other satellites, especially commercial satellites, are, are not. And... Um, sometimes there's space state sponsored, uh, jamming of a satellite signal, um, North Korea and Iran are fairly well known for doing that, for blocking access to satellite signals. Um, they do that to, um, often to prevent media broadcasts over their territory. And so this is something that is common and it's a, it's an off the shelf technology. So for a, a satellite system that's less well protected, um, doesn't have as good of, um, uh, secrecy isn't the right word. I'm trying to think of the right word, but um, encryption, it, 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 you know, it, it can be done. And at a military to military level, there's certainly growing investment in um, capabilities to engage in electronic warfare and also to protect your systems from, from such attacks and from such interference. Um, well, you know, when it comes to the scale of bad things that can happen in space, it's certainly uh, something that's concerning. And there's a great new report out today um, called Defending Against the Dark Arts that I can send you after. I haven't had a chance to go through it because it just landed on my desk. But it details a lot of a lot of what's happening. Uh-huh. Okay. Now, what I, I didn't know this, and, and I have heard that back in the Cold War that the, Russia tried to jam... Voice of America kinds of um, uh, newscasts that were sent in to us because they didn't want citizens to know what was going on. But I didn't, I, that was before the days of satellites. So I think, I don't know how they did it, but it, it's the same idea now. Is that right? They're, they're just trying to interrupt each other. They're not trying yeah. to damage each other's satellites, are they? Because that would, wouldn't that be an act of war to actually uh, wreck somebody else's satellite permanently? Probably, yes. <laughs> Again, these are some of the questions that aren't very clear. Where is the line between peace, rising hostility, and outright warfare? Um, there's just so many unknowns. But certainly, uh, if one country destroyed another country's satellite, that would definitely fall into the extreme category of warfare. Um Jamming, spoofing, that seems to be more tolerated. Now, um, you also use the word dazzled. I mean, I, this is all, all these words are completely alien to me. Da- what would dazzling or spoofing or jamming involve? And are they the same thing? 
Uh, they're not. Oh. And uh, I know I've, I've had to look through a lot of the, the jargon that seems jargonistic and yet is very important. Um, and so jamming is when you make a signal not available um, to be used. So you, you interrupt the ability of the end user to, to make use of the system to access the data. Spoofing is common with GPS. So that's when you um, can replace data with other data. And so when you have ships going the wrong way, sometimes it's because the GPS data has been spoofed and they've been sent in a different direction. So you're, you're interfering with the integrity of the data, not blocking access to it. Uh, dazzling was more related to lasers. And so that would be a lower, a lower power laser that might blind the sensors of a satellite so that it can't take images, mm -hmm. for instance, over, or over a certain territory. That is certainly less common um, as far as I know. Okay, well, when I've heard people say that, you know, the next war is not going to be, you use the word kinetic, I hadn't heard it use that word, but I know what it means, you know, physical things hitting physical things, right? Well, that it, the next war will be electronic, uh, things like uh, keeping our banks from actually knowing how much money we have, or, you know, uh, uh, ruining the record keeping or the communication system that we depend on with the internet. Now, to what extent uh, would that involve the use of what you're talking about in terms of satellites? Do our banks, um, when we send money, say from Tokyo to New York, does it go by satellite? And if somebody tried to interrupt that communication, would the banks get confused about where the money went? Absolutely. So cyber, cyber warfare, cyber um, activities in space are another vulnerability, especially because satellites stay up there for a long time and we use them for a long time. And uh, they're not always up to date in terms of how to, how to, prote how to be protected from satellite inter uh, cyber interference. Um, there's been a few efforts to do a day without space videos that try to convey the extent to which we rely on outer space. So what kind of harm could happen to not just military users, but to everyday users? Uh, certainly banking, communications, the internet, uh, shipping, uh, nav all navigation, global navigation, so, so air flight, it's, it's all running through space. Um, I think what is helpful to keep in mind though is it doesn't run through a single satellite. Um, and so the idea that the entire world's banking system would be knocked out through one activity, I think is a bit of a stretch. Um, you know, there's resilience in our systems, but um, these are some of the concerns that people have about um, protecting outer space and making sure that it doesn't turn into a war zone just because it's not just a military zone, it's a civilian zone, it's a commercial zone. The users are global and um, all of our critical infrastructure is, is some way tied to outer space and the, and the data well, that it provides. Our military people or NSA people, whatever, I don't know who would be responsible for what, but are they working on developing ways of conducting a cyber war in this all out war sense, uh, you know, like World War Three being a cyber war? Um, I don't, I mean, I think cyber is very central to what most militaries around the world are working on and preparing for. And certainly, um, I know that cyber warriors have been brought into the, the Space Force as, as part of this preparation. Um, I don't think there would be a war that would be entirely cyber. I think what is really critical is that overlap and interlinking between, as you say, the electronic and the cyber, and then and then the hardware and the real life applications on the ground. Um, and, and that's probably making it worse. <laughs> the fact that there are real life kinetic impacts, physical impacts that happen through the effects of electronic or cyber activities, not just in space, on other on other systems as well. Um, now, you you've mentioned this uh, space force that uh, that Trump created. I'm going to blame it all on Trump, as if if he hadn't done it, nobody else ever would. But I I think that's debatable. <laughs> uh, okay, so they've created this thing 
that's like a third or fourth branch of the U.S. military. They have the Army, the Navy, the Marines, and now space. Is that right? Oh, and the air. What, yeah, I think it's the sixth. It's number six. I think so. Six. What are the others? Um, let's see. Uh, it doesn't matter. But okay. So they're planning to have these space warriors, which I believe are going to be called guardians. <laughs> that's right. That's right. The guardians. <laughs> Sounds ridiculous. It is hard to keep a straight face sometimes. <laughs> oh, really? It is, isn't it? Um, well, okay. So we've got to be protected by these guardians from whom? And what, what is the, the game plan? They're planning a, a space war between ourselves and some other country. And <laughs> tell me, tell me what they think they're going to do. What is it that they've got to guard us from these guardians? Well, that's a good question. What are they going to do is a different question. Um, the risk or threat um, that has been publicly described um, is primarily emanating from China and Russia, according to official statements. And mm. um, the thinking there is that Again, the, the capabilities to interfere with satellites are accelerating. States are becoming more willing to use them. This is a broad range of capabilities as we've been discussing. And my sense is that the primary focus is how do you make these systems secure so that we can continue to use them and rely on them even during a conflict. Um, and then the second component is the offensive role. And what that looks like is not very clear. Um, but the first weapon to officially be procured by the Space Force is a satellite jammer, which we were talking about earlier, an electronic warfare type uh, system. Um, okay, but they, they painted as Russia and China primarily, and so more of a great power competition in space scenario. Now, this jammer would be presented as a defensive weapon? Um, no, that would be an offensive well, what's a defensive weapon in, in, when it comes to this kind of technology? Defending space is hard. Uh, when it comes to electronic warfare and almost any interference with a satellite system, what is really key is uh, being able to detect when your system is being interfered with um, and then being able to respond. So to shift to a different system, to, um, to change how the system's working or to try to block and, and, and find the source of that interference. Um, that's really a defensive approach. Um, well, how do they do that? Or I guess I, I'm not an engineer. But it is a technological question, right? Yeah. What do you as Project Plowshares, and, you know, I'm, I'm your ally, the, though the kind of ally that doesn't have a clue what you're doing. So kind of I'm giving moral support to whatever you want to do. Now tell me what we're doing. You know, what is the game plan? What is the intention? Uh, what do you see as the need for improving our peaceful orientation and reducing the risk of violence of any kind involving outer space? Uh, there's probably a lot of different steps that need to be taken. Um, it is encouraging to see that there is momentum building right now on creating uh, norms of behavior that would apply to military or security actors in outer space. That is something that has been championed for quite a while. The idea is that you identify um, not restrictions on hardware, but the kinds of behaviors that you expect states to engage in, in a way that uh, doesn't create additional tensions or escalatory behavior in space. And so one example is, um, you know, keeping, keeping distant from another satellite, um, not getting too close to another satellite would be one, one example where there might be room to identify what the appropriate uh, behavior is so that you're not um, unintentionally creating more. So the idea here is more prevention. Um, there's a lot in space that is dual use, which is probably a term you're very familiar with, um, but- Dual use being both military and legitimate civilian 
That's yeah, or, or systems that can do more than one thing, mm -hmm. um, right? They, they can maneuver, um, you know, satellites can maneuver in space. And so how do you reassure others of your good intentions? Um, and so this is, this is being led now diplomatically at the United Nations First Committee by the United Kingdom. And a lot of states are supporting the initiative to try to start a conversation about what kind of activities do you feel threatened by? Do you worry you as a, as a military actor in space and what kind of behaviors make you feel reassured and make you feel safe. Mm -hmm. And I think having that conversation and starting to identify what we expect states to do, which also is easy, makes it easier to identify abnormal behavior in space that might be more worrying. I think, I think that's a good first step. And I've done a lot of work this past year at Project Plowshares on that, on you know, what are some of the norms that we can build on? Uh, what kind of activities are already in place? What kind of rules are already in place and how can they be extended? Um, but that research also led me to focus more on, on the need for arms control. You, you can call it arms control, you can call it formal military restrictions. But, you know, Meta, we've been talking a lot about the disastrous consequences that can happen from war fighting in space. And so I think identifying some, some hard limits um, is important, um, you know, and I think some that are readily available that are already sort of part of the outer space treaty and, and part of our normative approach to outer space are things like not contaminating the environment. So not producing a lot of debris that would make a mess that would make it, um, where you, you end up having unintended consequences and harm to other actors. That's something that we think about on earth and it's something we should be thinking about on space. Well, I've heard that there's already so much junk up there that we need a cleanup operation of some kind. Absolutely, so but the, you know- The space force, send them out to street, this, sweep the streets. Maybe instead of an arms race, we need a cleanup race. <laughs> That's good. All right. Um, but, you know, harm to civilian systems. Uh, maybe that's something we could start thinking about. Well, and now, uh, what we you've agreed is a normal procedure, a process that people are jamming each other or interfering with each other's information system already. That, to me, uh, I, I was shocked and horrified. Is there any poss possibility of getting that banned, that kind of thing uh, banned? Um, I'm not sure that we're getting very close to a ban. Um, I've also heard the argument that allowing some types of interference that are less harmful is better. I think in that kind of situation, what would be really helpful would be to have more information-sharing about what is happening to systems. So more transparency to make, uh, to make actors aware of the problem and to, uh, to make it less discreet. I think what's so appealing about electronic warfare is you can do it behind, not behind a closed door, but it's not such a public act. It's easy to do it and, and hide behind it. And mm -hmm. um, it, it can be hard to identify who's doing what. And so I think better data sharing and transparency on, you know, what, uh, you know, is there an anomaly with a system? Has there been a, an ex a, a case or an incident of jamming? I think that would be helpful. Um, I'm not, I, I think, I think we'd start commercially because militaries are, are often reluctant to share information like this as are commercial operators who don't want to acknowledge that their systems have been harmed. But I think bringing more transparency and being more open and sharing data about the type of interference that, that operators are experiencing would be a step in the right direction. Okay. How would you do that? If the military wouldn't go along with that degree of disclosure, uh, how could you get commercial enterprises to take that much initiative? I'm not sure, honestly. Um, these kinds of initiatives really have to come out of an operational level and an operator level. So they're not a an idea that's going to work very well top down, I don't think. Um, but what's really great about space is we've seen the commercial sector take a lot of um, ownership and starting to lead best practices in outer space and other areas, mm -hmm. um, trying to think about rules of behavior that make space safer for everybody um, without having to have a new treaty or, or a huge um, 
really? you know, a, a really big out undertaking. And, you know, commitments, I think, on debris prevention are important. Um, they're starting to have conversations about, you know, what would the rules around debris removal look like? Because that's something that could be concerning for other, other actors, right? Uh, what are the rules around servicing? That's an exciting new aspect of outer space where we are developing the capability to be able to service and repair a satellite and have it last longer. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what are the rules about that, though? Because you're approaching another satellite, you're, you're, you're physically grappling with it. And so um, I think we're starting to see more initiative coming out of a a commercial interest <laughs> and a need for well-being in outer space. And I'm hoping that that same kind of conversation can start happening at a military level. And I think that's really the idea of the United Kingdom's initiative on this is to start the conversation and, um, and do a little bit of a, a bottom-up approach um, yeah. rather than top-down, let's fix everything at once, which just doesn't work in a really complex environment. Okay, I mean, you you contrasted uh, the initiatives by commercial enterprises to establish rules. You contrasted that to the treaty system. So, um, are you suggesting that there are already any kind of regulations that have been adopted, agreed upon, or even implicitly assumed by uh, businesses that? Uh, haven't been are not reflected in any treaties or formal uh, documents. Um, I'm not sure there's anything that's not reflected in a formal document because I uh, documents is really what I looked at last year. Um, but there are other rules other than the treaty, and so uh, one example are the long-term sustainability goals, and those were developed. Um, through the United Nations Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, um, developed over about a decade and adopted mm. I think, in 2019. And those set standards of behavior for, uh, for debris production, for not contaminating the environment, um, for um, publishing policies, national policies, for adhering to existing rules, uh, tools such as the registration convention, which is the way that states uh, disclose the, uh, the functions and identities of objects that they've launched in outer space. And so there's a lot more than the Outer Space Treaty. It's really the foundation at the heart of everything. And then there's other things that have been built around it. And I think continuing to build around is really a good approach to security. Okay, now you space. mentioned it's sort of a committee or something on the peaceful uses of outer space. Okay, that is autonomous or separate from, or is it a, is it an aspect of the treaty on the uh, prohibition of, uh, wep of weapons of mass destruction in space? Great question. It's not, it's not a committee that a lot of people outside the space community are aware of. It is located under the fourth committee of, uh, of the United Nations, which is um, special and decolonization. That's the committee that was established to negotiate the Outer Space Treaty. Um, and that's where the treaty was negotiated, as well as the other four treaties. The rest, um, so there's the registration convention, there's um, the rescue agreement for astronauts, um, there's the moon oh, treaty. Really? Yeah, so How there's a treaty on, on rescuing astronauts. So what the other treaties do is they flesh out the, those really broad principles of the Outer Space Treaty to say, okay, well, what does this look like in practice? What do we mean by this? How do we implement the principles? And yeah, one is res uh, the rescue and return of astronauts, of, of personnel. Because when you remember back to the dawn of the space age, it was also at the height of the Cold War. And, um, you know... I, I'm, I'm uh, uh, <laughs> boggled by the notion of actually rescuing an astronaut. I, it sounds like Apollo ten or something. Where or return to when you? Yeah. You, so when the when the capsules land, where do they land? If they were to land in in another territory, you're not going to keep the astronaut. You're going to return <laughs> return the astronaut to the country of origin. Um, so so the idea of not not holding astronauts hostage and and really the the special role that they have played as ambassadors for peace in outer space. I think. Well, that's neat to know that there is such a thing. I had no notion that we, we've already worked out all these little yeah. details in advance. So many things to left to work out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, um, good luck. <laughs> because, uh, you know, you, you're certainly doing 
you're boldly going where no one has gone before, some whatever. <laughs> well, there's a great community, and I think that's what's really important. You mentioned Laura Grego, and there's a lot of other really terrific people who work on this. On, on the Canadian side, Paul Meyer, a uh, longstanding yes. Canadian ambassador who continues to do excellent work on this file. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we're really blessed to have a, a, a wonderful community of people who really work together cooperatively to try to improve uh, the security situation in space and prevent it from turning into a a domain of war fighting. Well, are the are the Russians and well, the Russians are the main ones doing outer space besides the US. uh, How how much cooperation is there between uh, uh, Russians working on these issues and and, you, you know, Canadians that you just mentioned, for example? In terms of approach at the state level, there's been a divide. Um, and so I told you there's momentum building to, to hammer out what these rules of, of behavior might be, which is a non-binding, non-treaty approach to security. And on the flip side, um, since 2008, Eight, I believe Russia and China have jointly proposed um, a formal treaty that would um, prevent the weaponization of outer space. And so those two approaches have kind of been conflicting. Um, there's uh, I'm sorry, how so? Two approaches. It, it, tell me the conflict. The conflict is between states that want to see a legally binding treaty on arms control in outer space and states that don't see that functioning well, they don't feel served by that approach and prefer to focus on behaviors in outer space um, for a number of reasons that that get reiterated every year. Um, okay. And, and so, what, what side are you on? Honest, well, I think I, as, as I explained earlier, I think the rules is a really good place to start. Um, I do think there's limits to rules of behavior. And um, I think trying to identify what the restrictions on warfare and space should be, where the limits should be uh, for the protection of civilians, for the protection of the environment is important. Um, so I think we kind of need both approaches. And I'll, I think a lot of states feel that way as well, that they want to start with norms and transparency and confidence building and, and then move on from there. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's not a lot of trust in outer space right now. As in many other issues, uh, there's not a lot of transparency about what some states are doing from a military perspective. There's a lot of accusations that are taking place. And I think being able to step back and, and bring transparency and um, and bring some basic rules and etiquette to how we behave in outer space is a really good place to start. Wonderful. Well, you're on the side of the angels. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> that I'm sure but- Appreciate having their domain protected from. Uh, um, Meta, you should go back and watch Star Wars. It's, it's a know. great series. So my children, we watched it as part of our pandemic yeah. survival toolkit really? when we first went into lockdown last March. And um, my daughter is born on May the fourth, and so yeah. that is usually t- called Star Wars Day because they say, may, may the fourth be with you. <laughs> and uh, she knows her Star Wars canon inside and out. <laughs> uh, well, and, was- and, and they're the ones that got me to watch it. I hadn't really watched it before <laughs> either. And uh, it's quite engaging. And I promise you that what we're talking about today looks nothing like that. Um, okay. <laughs> and that is much more entertaining. <laughs> I was in Paris that year, that summer, when uh, Star Wars came out. And I remember seeing lines of people trying to get into the theaters. But, you know, I, my French wasn't up to it. And my English, I don't think it, they were showing it in English. I don't know. Anyway. Whatever. Now there's about nine movies. So it does feel daunting to try to jump into it now. <laughs> <sighs> okay. But I, I, the, the lingo is everywhere. You know, you hear about. Darth Vader and Luke Star- Skywalker, yep. and I know the names of all the people. I don't know who they are, but <laughs> anyway. You know enough. <laughs> good. This has been fun, Jessica. Thank you very, very much, and all good wishes for what you're doing. It's terrific work. Thank Give you. My good good regards to the your friends at uh, Flush Airs, because they're yes. fine, fine people. They are, and I really miss <laughs> seeing them every day at the office. I can't wait until we're all together again. Very good. Thanks so much. You take care. Bye. Bye, Meta.